China is moving decisively towards universal health and improving its medical performance. To fulfill these ambitions, the right technologies, the right assets and the right services will have to be found at the right price. As one of the world's leading centres for medical expertise and as a pioneer in combining quality with efficiency in its public health, Britain can serve as a highly effective ally in meeting the rising expectations across China for improving standards of care. If we look at the healthcare sector, it's one of the key sectors where the Chinese government is looking to reform and modernise the sector as a whole. And the UK has got a wealth of expertise to offer, whether it's the design and operation of hospitals, um, whether it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's medical devices, um, or whether it's the equipment that goes into hospitals. The UK has got a wealth of expertise that could be brought to bear. So now is a tremendous opportunity um, on the back of the National Health Service, which is highly regarded um, by the Chinese side, um, to look for new opportunities to engage with China. The ordinary population of the great and successful new economies want to see some benefit flowing from the new wealth of the country. And there are giant middle classes emerging who actually expect international standards of healthcare. So th there are perfectly sensible, objective reasons why most of the Asian governments are going to invest vast sums in improving their healthcare systems. And actually, uh, the Asian middle classes are going to spend a lot more money in the private healthcare system on their own health as well. I think the, the, the scale of change in, in healthcare in China is, is probably unprecedented. Um, it's, a, it's a central plank of the 12th five-year plan that the Chinese government is, is currently engaged in at the moment. And we're seeing changes across all areas of the healthcare sector. They have a desire to provide universal healthcare to their whole population which is something that they've, they've never done before, they've never tried to do before, but now they're in a position to be able to spend a lot of money on the healthcare sector. Britain has the most cost-effective system, as well as the one of the best records of delivery. I mean, obviously standards are as good in the United States or in Germany or elsewhere, but they waste a fortune. We spend 8% of our GDP and deliver a better system than the Americans do, who spend twice as much of their vast GDP, pour it into a pretty hopeless healthcare system which they're trying to reform. We can demonstrate to people who are objective enough to look at us from China that we do have, from a lot of points of view, probably the best system in the world. In public health, Britain has a long record of developing clinical and administrative solutions that are both innovative and affordable. At the University Hospital in Nottingham, evidence is now being assembled on how this knowledge can best be transferred to meet Asia's challenges in treating chronic conditions, in offering care in growing cities and to ageing populations. Here we are in the medical school at the University of Nottingham and you may ask the question why is Nottingham interested in um, contributing to healthcare improvements in Asia. For us this is a really important issue. The University of Nottingham is well recognised for its international perspective and we have campuses both in Malaysia and in China at Ningbo. And we're really interested in using these campuses as an opportunity to engage with the healthcare agenda in Asia. So the biggest change that's happening in many Asian countries is that people are living longer. And as a consequence, the range of diseases which are important to manage in a healthcare community are changing. So for example, in China, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is predicted to be the largest cause of mortality within about 15 to 20 years by the World Health Organization. And there's also a rise in conditions associated with diet, such as type 2 diabetes, and an increasingly elderly population, which is also struggling because of demographic changes in that the family unit is broken up to some extent and people moving to the, to the new cities, but many of the elderly people staying in rural communities. So there's a need to both identify solutions and also to introduce systems to help manage these groups of patients. 
The University of Nottingham is looking at establishing a centre for evidence-based healthcare in China. And the reason we think this is important is because the solutions which will work within different countries, China or indeed other Asian countries, will vary from country to country. So what we are hoping to do through the physical base of our campus in China is to establish collaborations both with local hospitals, with universities and indeed nationally with other centres of excellence through China. Partnership building is, is something where we have made a, a lot of progress in the last several years. By putting in place a partnerships team where there's an explicit responsibility on individuals to sell the technology and the expertise that the university's got to offer, but to sell it in a way that is tuned to the market so that we've got partnership managers who speak the language of business but understand the academic world as well and can bridge that gap. So the key thing for any successful innovation is to put together an ecosystem which will be self-sustaining. For me the most important thing is that one has to incentivize the, the academics or the clinicians to engage in innovation. There's got to be reason for them to do it, whether that's going to benefit them personally or it's going to help their careers. So first of all some incentivization and then we've got to put together the, the supply chain really to get the discovery from the lab into the marketplace and that means putting in IP professionals, it means putting in commercial people who can cut deals with the medical device companies or the healthcare providers. It means putting in patent attorneys and bringing in investors so that you can accelerate that journey. University like Nottingham and indeed other universities within the UK have a vast experience of um, looking at evidence-based solutions to help with the healthcare agenda. So I guess these fall into a number of different areas. First of all, we're extremely experienced in reviewing the available evidence through things like systematic reviews in order to work out what solutions are likely to be most effective to deal with a, sp a specific um, healthcare issue. Secondly, we have very good experience of public health research, both in terms of epidemiology, looking at the causes of medical problems, but also in terms of the sorts of delivery um, uh, of solutions to, to communities. The main challenge in dealing with healthcare issues in Asia is being able to take things which work in a UK context but actually to adapt them such that they work effectively within what's often a very different cultural um, uh, environment and indeed sometimes a different political environment. And I think that that has to be a two-way process. So it's really important that universities or indeed other healthcare providers in the UK understand the context of the environment in which they're working in Asia and adapt accordingly. I think just imposing a UK solution to try and solve a healthcare problem is doomed to failure if one doesn't understand the context the environment you're working in. So it has to be this two-way process, it's really important because what we want is to be able to provide solutions which are both innovative but also will benefit the local communities which they're designed to influence in terms of healthcare delivery. The growth in, in, in China's middle class uh, brings to the healthcare sector are considerable. There is a, a growing uh, instances of people being able to spend a lot more on, on um, things that they might not have spent money on in the past. Um, their discretionary income is, is growing all the time and there is now a willingness and an ability to pay for healthcare services for example. And we're also starting to see instances of uh, wealthy Chinese coming over to the UK to, to make the most of, of the health provision that's available uh, in this country. There are a number of hospitals that we know of in the UK who are already looking at the market for bringing in individual patients from China um, who are looking to, to have a the very high quality level of healthcare which uh, our private healthcare services can provide. In London's top hospitals like the Booper Cromwell Hospital, teams are combining across disciplines to bring in the latest technologies for patients. 
lupus purpose is for patients to live longer, healthier, happier lives. As part of that, the Cromwell Hospital is all about providing excellent care for patients and also giving them excellent service. So it's not just about the care, it's being able to give them that VIP treatment so that everybody feels that they've had individualised care and all the outcomes are of the top quality. We welcome patients from over 140 different countries. And because we have this experience, it means that we can provide that really specialised care for them. And we have an understanding of all their cultural needs. We can provide translation services, specific food, um, we're aware of their religious needs. Um, and we have a dedicated international patient centre. And this patient centre is there just for these international patients. And they look after them, they book their appointments, and they make sure the whole journey is tailored around their requirements. Half of our patients actually come from um, international markets and that's matched with the staff. We have staff from over 50 different countries. So we really are experts in providing that individual care for any nationality. We can deal with the whole patient journey at the Cromwell Hospital and that's everything from diagnostics all the way through to final treatment for cancer patients and palliative care. That requires patient coordinators and these people are responsible for following that whole patient journey and arranging everything for them, um, including interpreting services, so that they don't need to worry about anything. We do all the worrying for the patients and make sure that they know exactly where they need to be and at what time. The best way to deliver the best medical care is to work in multidisciplinary teams of clinicians. At the Booper Cromwell Hospital, we have recruited from the great teaching hospitals of London teams of clinicians that can deliver the optimal care for the individual patient. The Booper Cromwell Hospital is famous for its innovation and the introduction of the leading edge technologies for the benefit of patients. We find in the multidisciplinary forums that we can discuss what is happening at the leading edge of medical technology and coming out of the research centres in the Great London Teaching Hospitals and get it in early into the Booper Cromwell Hospital for the benefit of patients. We have a very strong reputation for introducing innovative technology such as the gamma knife for brain tumours and tomotherapy for tumours at other sites in the body, both of which can deliver high quality radiation to kill the tumour but not harm the rest of the body. Booper is an international company with operations in Thailand, Hong Kong, China and India. Working in partnership with the many London University hospitals, we can share expertise on new care pathways, healthcare economics, healthcare management, new drugs, and new technologies and services we'd like to provide. We have recently introduced procedures such as the TAVI procedure. This is a transaortic valvular insertion. It's a minimally invasive procedure which allows the, a patient to have a new valve inserted but without having to have open heart surgery. We are also looking to introduce a high free procedure, which is high intensity focal ultrasound, and this is for the treatment of prostate cancer. Screening allows for early detection and ultimately early treatment of diseases such as lung cancer. We have recently introduced a lung cancer screening program at the Booper Cromer Hospital. Working with the latest technology such as CT scanning and lung function diagnostic testing and in conjunction with the consultants from across London's leading university hospitals, we were able to test patients, review the results as part of a multidisciplinary team and then plan their care going forward. The consultants that work with us work in um, the top teaching hospitals in London and that means we have access to all their research and new techniques. We are able to share that information with any partners across the world. We can do that either via a web-based system or we can do it with visiting doctor programmes. Either our doctors will go to that country or doctors from the other country can come and visit us and watch what we're doing. An example of where we have transferred our knowledge is we've been working with Quality Healthcare, which is Boop Hong Kong Clinics, and we've been able to share with them our protocols in relation to lung screening, I mean, in relation to our, a lot of activity we've done in reducing falls for patients and that knowledge is something that they found really useful because it's meant that they've then been introduced new techniques within their own care programmes within Hong Kong.
The work that the, the UK has done over the years in developing innovation in healthcare is something that stands us in very good, good stead in the Chinese context. The development that we've seen across the NHS, for example, over the years is now being viewed by the Chinese government as something that they might be able to replicate in, in China itself. So there are significant opportunities we see for collaboration between UK and Chinese organisations across the healthcare sector. Now, whether that's in biotech, pharma or in medical devices, the opportunities are there. Britain is changing the way it develops medical technologies, opening up innovation to collaboration, often with partners in Asia. In areas such as personalised medicine or frugal engineering, Rhys Williams of Abel and Imre is reporting a growing two-way flow of intellectual property. I think markets for medical technology in Asia are clearly evolving very rapidly. Uh, we all know that the Chinese economy, for example, is growing very quickly, 8% uh, increase in GDP last year. But within that, uh, spending on healthcare increased by 22%, so almost three times as much. The increase in demand for innovation and new solutions is clearly evidenced by the increase in patenting activity that we're experiencing in the Asian markets and also coming from the Asian markets into Europe and the UK. The UK is working on lots of new uh, and innovative schemes to promote collaboration between the healthcare and academic industries. For example, we have the Academic Health Science Centres where healthcare providers and academic institutions are working directly together uh, to ensure that any breakthroughs in medical technology are being accessed by the patient as soon as possible. The scope for collaboration and partnerships between British and Asian companies is very high. This is both with British companies creating intellectual property and licensing it to Asian companies and also we're increasingly seeing, uh, and personally I've recently been on a visit to China where I was directly visiting Chinese companies uh, creating intellectual property, uh, we're seeing Asian companies filing their own patent applications and looking to exploit them in the UK through licensing and collaboration agreements. I think a good example of the way in which the technology transfer market is working is to look at our client Qchip. Qchip work in microfluidics and drug delivery systems. They were spun out from Cardiff University a number of years ago and since then they've established their own extensive portfolio of intellectual property. Uh, and they're looking for, to the Asian markets to, to grow and in a recent conversation with their managing director, uh, he was telling me about how uh, several similar sized companies had recently received significant investment from or been bought out by large Indian pharmaceutical firms. Two trends really stand out for me. Uh, at one end of the spectrum you have uh, precision or personalised medicine, which relies very heavily on the cutting edge in therapeutic and diagnostic technology. And at the other end of the spectrum, and I think equally as interesting, is frugal engineering. And this is where technology that was previously too expensive or complex to roll out in Asian markets is being re-engineered to be simpler, cheaper and easier to use. Both trends are creating intellectual property and both trends are having real effects on patient outcomes. In any business relationship, uh, trust between the parties is key. With modern technology, it's very easy to communicate with uh, email, telephone, video conferencing. Uh, but I think particularly at the beginning of a relationship, then personal contact is key. And that's something that I've found working with the Asian clients that I have and work directly for. From a patent attorney's perspective, if a client has taken the necessary steps to protect their intellectual property, then they can approach the relationship with their Asian customers in a much more open and relaxed way. Rather than provide dry academic style of legal advice, at Able and Inmay we do our very best to understand the commercial needs and objectives of our clients. Rather than be seen as a remote entity, uh, only to be consulted at times of dire need, we like to sort of integrate ourselves within a client's research and development team. As a firm, we've worked within the Asian markets for many years. Partners of the firm have been visiting Asian businesses and local attorneys for over 20 years. This means we've experienced and understand the challenges that our clients face when entering those markets. At first glance, 
protecting intellectual property in the Asian markets can appear overwhelming. There are differences in the legal systems and the procedures that you have to follow. However, essentially the core principles do remain the same. We have an extensive network of foreign associates that we work closely with, meaning that we can give the right advice to the clients at the right time. So rather than be put off by operating in these markets, which can seem intimidating at first, then we recommend that any British company make sure they have the right advisors to give them the necessary advice for doing so, whether that be a legal advisor such as myself uh, or one of the various Asian business councils that are available. Well, pharma, firstly we have some of the great research-based manufacturing companies in the world, but they're, obviously their products are all over Asia already. Britain's strength in pharmaceutical products is you know, world class. What we also can help our Asian partners with is the business of actually how you purchase, sort of store, distribute, dispense in a cost-effective, non-wasteful way the pharmaceutical products that your doctors want to use. In the 21st century, Asia will want to be where Britain is in managing the dispensing and distribution of pharmaceutical products. There's a lot going on in, in the pharmaceutical side and, and the wider life sciences field. Um, for example, uh, there are significant uh, joint projects going on um, between UK and Chinese institutions for drug development, for example. And we've seen the huge increase in investment by UK drug companies in China um, who are looking to uh, develop not only medicines for the Chinese market but also for the, for the global market as well. Britain has an extraordinary record for developing new therapies and treatments. Here one entrepreneurial scientist based at the centre of British drug discovery highlights the potential for creating solutions to Asia's growing list of diseases and conditions. At this moment, we are standing at the centre of the Golden Triangle in the UK, the triangle formed by London, Cambridge and Oxford. And that is at the very heart of the European life sciences industry. What that gives us is access to an extraordinary set of innovative products and technologies. The task for us now is to be able to take that innovative step over to the Asian market. But you have to remember that the innovative step we have here is the very early spark. That's the unique element of the UK market. We're driven by two extremely powerful forces. A development in the funding environment in Europe and the need to access the new markets growing in Asia. When we looked at this area, we looked at the whole region as opportunities for Dynasty to establish operations and to bring technology. And we looked at Singapore and Hong Kong and other, and other locations. But in the end, we chose to start with China. The motives, the power of the interest from China are absolutely extraordinary. The infrastructure is fantastic. And that gives us a great opportunity to drive this market. So if you look at the access to technology in Europe, if you look at the Ernst & Young figures on the pipeline of products under development in phase one, phase two, the UK leads the way in Europe and there are around a thousand new products coming through. So the products that we're developing are exactly in line with the Chinese demand in oncology, in neurology, and our ability from the UK to service that market starts from the pipeline of products we have in play. As an entrepreneur, there are particular challenges in life sciences due to the very heavy science nature of the initial moment of many of these companies. This creates a particular problem and many times a uh, technical founder needs to work with someone like me, a more commercial individual, to bring a company to life. The opportunity with Asia is extraordinary and we have a rather strange view of the world right now, which is that Asia is closer than France. So as a businessman, it's easier for me to consider setting up a business now and developing that business in China than perhaps elsewhere in Europe. Europe has an amazing record in innovation, actually. Over the years, if you look at the current market for medical products, around 20% of all those products aren't just developed in Europe, they're developed in the UK. So we have a doubling 
of the government spending and support in this area in the last 10 years. We have extraordinary ability in the clinical trials process and indeed Asia is learning from that ability now so that the clinical trials we're running in Asia are now at the US FDA standard. So the other element that's interesting to add is natural products. The Chinese in Asia are very interested in natural products from their traditional uh, medicines. We actually have access to a fantastic bank of uh, new products in that area, particularly from marine biotechnology. So for example, we are working very closely from Dynasty's point of view with the European Marine Biotechnology Institute based here in the UK. Well, when we're looking at the development of products in Asia, we look at a phrase or two phrases that are clear to people. First of all, is a product China ready? Is it at a stage of development that is ready to make best use of the asset uh, in China? Or is it China relevant? Is it a product that relates to a key issue that the uh, government is seeking to address in China? If a product hits both of those requirements, then we can definitely develop that product in Asia. We will get support for that product in China and we'll get access to market for that product in China. In terms of taking products to Asia, we actually see China as an accelerator for the development of that technology. We can take a UK innovation, we can accelerate its development at the fastest possible rate, and then we can roll it out to address the global problems of healthcare in the world. So we're working with our Asian partners. We've learned some amazing lessons. First of all, one starts to think that the two markets are utterly different. As soon as you get under the skin of doing business in Asia, you find this not to be the case. We have different ways of doing business, but the fundamental drivers are exactly the same. So we have built a bridge between the UK and Asia. The task now is to increase the traffic on that bridge, both product going to Asia for development and access to market, but also Asian companies coming to the UK. And I'd be very pleased to help Asian companies address the UK market, access the network here in the heart of the Golden Triangle. There's a lot going on in, in, in medical devices and, and the growth that, that we've seen over the last few years has been phenomenal in, in the take up um, of overseas devices um, in, in China. There is a desire by Chinese hospitals uh, to um, buy overseas kit um, and a lot of that hopefully will continue to come from, from the UK. Um, and the, and the, the issue of the Chinese now being able to be able to pay for um, operations that they may not have been able to pay for in the past is, is, is significant in this too. Uh, the rise in discretionary spending means that they may now be in a position to afford to pay something towards a, an operation, for example, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, which they may not have been able to afford in the past. Demand for medical devices such as the replacement, even regeneration of hips, knees and shoulders is growing quickly in Asia. At JRI Orthopaedics, they're adapting the latest science to create affordable designs to get people moving comfortably again. JRI Orthopaedics were founded in 1970 by Ronald Furlong, an orthopaedic surgeon. The company work with leading institutions on cutting edge research, translating those into new products and obtaining the relevant regulatory approvals before bringing those to market to help patients and to improve their lives. The company is unique in that it's wholly owned by an orthopaedic research charity, Orthopaedic Research UK, and we donate our profits to that charity to fund independent research that will ultimately benefit patients' lives. The orthopaedic implants that JRI design and precision manufacture are to treat musculoskeletal problems, essentially wear and tear of joints. This causes patients a lot of pain and also significantly limits their mobility. So by using a JRI implant, appropriately fitted, that can completely remove pain and it can actually significantly increase the mobility of that patient, giving them a much more active life. We've been working internationally for more than 20 years, predominantly in the EU, in markets such as Spain and Germany, and also Australia and New Zealand. But increasingly what we're doing is bringing our products into new markets further afield, such as the USA, 
Brazil and the Far East. Asia has a huge population and many of those people may suffer from musculoskeletal problems and our products, precision manufactured here in Sheffield, can provide relief from pain and improve mobility for all those people. Increasingly those populations are becoming more urbanised and by relieving the problems of musculoskeletal problems patients can return to a much more active life and perhaps to economic activity too which can benefit governments. We've been in the business for a long time and the demands that are made of those joint replacements have changed quite considerably. What we provide now gives very very good functional outcomes and we're very confident that we can provide that. But the call from the NHS in particular but elsewhere around the world is for providing the same level of outcome for patients but to do it at a more competitive price. So we're actively getting involved in that and looking at how we can drive out costs and ways in which we can design in low cost but at the same time high quality outcomes with our products. Well one of the biggest challenges that we have in terms of design is that Traditionally, most of the work we've looked at have been looking at is design for people that are from a European descent. And what we now are looking at is that we see that those designs aren't always the most applicable elsewhere. And our new designs are to expand out our current portfolios, but looking at new products and making them so that they are very specifically usable all the way around the world, and in particular in Asia. So, very specific demands, there's extra movements that are required, so kneeling, um, uh, and also sizing is quite different. The UK has a long history of being very innovative in the, in the field of medical technologies, and that's particularly true in orthopaedics and surgery in general. And I'm very proud of the fact that we're working and co-developing new technologies that underpin what we do, working with universities and some of the leading experts in this area, both in the UK and across Europe. And what we're looking to do is be able to go beyond replacing joints to regenerating them. JRI comply with a number of regulatory standards and we always work from those standards, not to those standards, as a minimum. So that gives us confidence that these products are well made and supported importantly with medical education, and training, uh, and advice to the surgeons that use these implants. Working with our local partner to deliver that service and support, JRI are very careful when they select partners because we want to ensure that we always provide the surgeon and their patient with the best possible support wherever they may be. And ultimately we want the outcome to be fantastically successful for that patient so that as many patients as possible can benefit from these life transforming implants. We are at the forefront of uh, treatment and research in pretty well all the, the, the emerging chronic conditions which an ageing population suffers from. Most of the Asian countries are going to find that they're entering the stage now where their demography is going to give them an ageing population. And at the moment we give a lot of advice, there are a lot of professional seminars, there are a lot of contacts between specialists in all these important medical fields and so we're quite prepared to share our experience and professional expertise. But then also we can make economic benefit out of helping them deliver the services which pretty well every major Asian country requires to deal with a rising number of people with these these conditions which are the scourge of modern man, like diabetes and so on. To arrest the speed at which a chronic condition like diabetes is spreading, it can make sense to draw on what Asia has already known for centuries. In Oxford, advanced modern science is combining with traditional Asian remedies to develop a series of treatments which innovatively combine the old with the new. Vinova is a life science company that was founded here in Oxford 12 years ago. The big idea behind Vinova is that we believe that the medicinal plants, uh, particularly those plants that have been used in traditional medicines in Asia, uh, offer us a wonderful resource 
or a discovery engine for looking for and finding uh, new novel treatments for many of the common diseases that the modern world has to deal with today. For the last 12 years, Finova has focused on, on developing drugs and, and active ingredients for a number of, of different uh, diseases and conditions. We've developed a novel drug for chronic hepatitis C. Uh, we've got a drug now that's in a phase three trial in China for post-operative ileus. We've also developed a novel antibacterial topical treatment for MRSA. Our work with Aminonorm and its source material, mulberry leaf, is a very good example of the type of work that we're capable of as a company. We looked at mulberry leaf, which has been a traditional remedy in Asia for many centuries for, for the thirsty disease or what was then uh, a reference to diabetes. And what we found is that there are very good reasons why this leaf is active in controlling glucose levels. And, and we found that, it, that the active ingredients are something called amino sugars. And mulberry leaf actually has a number of amino sugars in them, some of them which previously haven't been discovered until we looked at them. So our product amino norm is really a, a, a concentrated form of these amino sugars that we extract from the leaf and provides a, a, a very good therapeutic effect for people with high glucose levels. Now this product is a, a functional ingredient which can be added to food. It can also be used as a supplement. And what Amino Norm does is it helps to control glucose levels. Now, in Asia, diabetes is already an epidemic. And it's 60% of the world's population of diabetics are in Asia. In China, for example, if these trends continue, uh, in the future, half of the Chinese uh, health budget will have to be spent on treating diabetes. By 2030, it's estimated that $300 billion will be needed to treat diabetic patients in Asia. So we feel, as a company, that this product that we've been working on for a number of years has a particular relevance for Asians throughout the region. In 2007, uh, Finova created a collaboration with Chinese scientists resulting in a joint venture company to do research and development uh, with traditional medicines in China, which has resulted in a, a number of new drugs uh, and healthcare products such as Aminonorm being developed. The scientists at Finova have developed a methodology for translating the traditional knowledge and by applying cutting edge technology to it, we are able to develop novel treatments for modern diseases. This East Meets West collaboration has been and continues to be a very successful collaboration and platform for developing new products. My experience with the British life science, I feel they can offer two aspects. One is the very advanced technology. For example, a lot of screen models available here. So by using those advanced screen models, so we can speed up the R&D process. The second aspect, I think, the, is the high standard of the scientists here. The scientists here, they are more creative and always with analytical thinking, so everything to the details. So, for example, when we design some experiments and such, they will think more in detail. By doing that, we can avoid some mistakes. So, as a result, the R&D process becomes more productive. We have spent many years developing products like Aminonorm, which can play an important role in Asia in helping to prevent the spread of diabetes and, and the increase in diabetes. What we are now doing is we've begun to commercialize Aminonorm in China and in India, and what we are looking for are partners in each of the Asian countries that we can work with who know their country 
and know the market there and who we can work with to bring these products into those markets. As a source of advanced science and affordable innovation, Britain has few equals. In public health, its rates of life expectancy are higher than in the US, yet overall expenditure is 60% less. For those wishing to explore potential partnerships, a whole series of channels is opening up. My real priority probably is really establishing proper contacts at the level where the decisions are made. Uh, we, we now have the, as it were, have good relations with the Chinese Ministry of Health in Beijing and the other places we keep targeting for trying to identify where there will be Chinese partners prepared to cooperate with us who are actually anxious to see whether uh, we can offer them more than uh, big competitors, the Germans, the Americans and others can offer them as they're about to develop their own services much further. I think one of the most important things to recognise about China is it isn't a single marketplace. Um, it is a continental market. Um, each province is almost the size of a European country. And that's actually one of the reasons why CBBC has 13 offices across the country. That's important for UK companies so that they can have local access to opportunities in China. But equally it's important to Chinese companies who are looking for partners from the UK and they can access our 13 offices through the local relevant authorities or their chambers of commerce or their trade associations in China. Well that's all we've got time for at the moment but if you'd like to find out more about any of the organisations that we've featured then visit our website thebusinesschannel.tv. Bye bye for now.